So I'm Noelle Gray Williams, I'm the chair of the English department. And one of the first um, uh, jobs I have t tonight is to thank the dean for helping to co-sponsor this event. But she's ran out to get more chairs for people. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll have to thank her in absentia. Um, we come together tonight to celebrate what is essentially the birth of Asian American literature. And I want to thank the sponsorship, um, as I said, the, the Dean of Humanities and the Arts for our Artistic Excellence Programming Grant. I also want to thank uh, the online journal, uh, Asian American Literature Discourses and Pedagogies, which is also a co-sponsor. Um, we're running, this is our 10th anniversary year, and in the 10th anniversary of the journal, um, Tara Fickle and Women Dariotis are guest editing a special issue on the IE. <coughs> I also want to thank Dr. Selena Anderson and the Center for Literary Arts and the staff of the English department uh, for their help in organizing, reporting, and advertising this event. Since this is a celebration of Asian American literature, I could not allow such important creative writers to come to San Jose State without allowing you to hear some of their work directly. So I'm going to do a brief introduction followed by a segment of time in which we can hear a sampling of the work of each of the artists visiting us today, um, the second, or at least hear from them. Uh, the second phase of the evening will be a discussion between our guests followed by a Q&A uh, open to the audience, and the evening will close with a book signing. When the IE, an anthology of Asian American writers, was published in 1974, it was one of the very first anthologies of its kind. The editors named their anthology after the limited self-expression granted Asian American men in mainstream culture up to that point. This is a quote from the introduction, or from the preface, actually. The pushers of white American culture that pictured the yellow man as something that, when wounded, sad, or angry, or swearing, or wondering, whined, shouted, or screamed, i.e., Asian American, Asian American, so long ignored and forcibly excluded from creative participation in American culture, is wounded, sad, angry, swearing, and wondering, and this is his IE. It is more than a whine, shout, or scream. It is 50 years of our whole voice. I often think of this anthology as, especially for the artist writing in its wake, as the kia one does in martial arts, that audible expression of your voice that helps you focus your strength. To put the IE's appearance into perspective, the very name Asian American was only about five years old at the time it came out. So we, we, it's, it's hard for us to think about like something that that an identity can be something that's invented, but that was really uh, came around uh, 68 or 69. The U.S. was at war in Vietnam. Saigon had not yet fallen, and the Vietnamese diaspora did not yet exist. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were still a few years off from founding Apple Computer. In 1974, the year of its publication, the President of the United States resigned rather than face impeachment. Many of the authors of the four editors, Jeffrey Paul Chan, Frank Chin, Lawson Inada, and Sean Wong, discovered or rediscovered and included in their anthology, such as Carlos Gulasan, Louis Chu, John Okada, and Hisei Yamamoto, define the canon of Asian American literature to this day. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have with us two of the, those editors, Sean Wong and Las Nada. <coughs> Sean Wong was the youngest of the four, and he began working out, uh, working on finding his literary ancestors when he was a student at UC Berkeley, and would receive his master's degree from San Francisco State in the same year the anthology was published. He has since gone on to publish two novels, Home Base and American Needs, the latter of which was made into a feature-length film. He has spent his career as a professor at the University of Washington and in addition to his novels, has edited six more anthologies that would go on to impact the literary field, including The Big IE in 1991 and two anthologies with the Before Columbus publication. <laughs> Look how fast, this is how fast the dean works, by the way. <laughs> They're already extra chairs for you. At the time the original IE was published, Lawson Fusaronado was already a poetry professor at Southern Oregon University and had been published in no more than one book of poems, including his single author, Before the War, Poems as They Happen. He would go on to be the Poet Laureate of Oregon and win the American Book Award for his poetry collection, Legends from Camp. Among a host of other publications, including one that's a couple that are right there, um, he also edited the frequently taught collection, Only What We Can Carry, the Japanese-American Internment Experience. Since this event today,
say is so much about the artistic discussion within the Asian American community. I felt it important that we have someone lead the discussion of the second phase of the event today, um, who is herself a key producer of Asian American literature, and who comes from a generation between that of the editors and that of today's students. We are honored today with the presence of poet Marilyn Chin, whose recent collection of Portrait of the Self as Nation, New and Selected Poems, brings together new poems with a retrospective of her entire career, bringing excerpts of her award-winning collections of Dwarf Bamboo, The Phoenix Spawn, The Terrace Empty, Rhapsody in Plain Yellow, Hard Love Province, pieces of her work of fiction, Revenge of the Moon Cake Vixen, and some of her translations. So it's kind of like the greatest hits, right? And it's all available right back there. So one stop shopping. Um, this year, she was awarded the Arts and Letters Award, Award for Literature by the American Academy of Arts and Letters for exceptional accomplishment. Um, and I think with that, um, I'm going to sit down and ask how much more we have. to read the essay that actually just was published today uh, by an Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, they asked me to uh, uh, write an essay about uh, recent controversy uh, involving uh, uh, the novel No No Boy. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, you'll, if you don't know the controversy, you'll, you'll figure it out through the through the reading. But uh, it's a it's a, it's a classic sort of Asian tale in the publishing world that's sort of like, like most uh, Asian stories, it involves uh, loyalty, betrayal, and revenge. Um, and, uh, except this takes place in the publishing world, uh, which you would think was not very exciting, but uh, this summer um, it took on a different tactic. Uh, uh, and also it will explain a little bit about our anthology uh, I.e. that was published in 1974. So, um, looking out here at the audience, I realize that Lawson and I have a book that's older than almost everybody in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, humbling to think. <laughs> in the spring of 2020, the University of Washington Press will reissue Louis Chu's classic 1961 Chinese American novel, Vita Bold of Tito, the first novel to capture the essence and spirit of New York's Chinatown, Bachelor Society post World War II. Its last printing by publisher Lyle Stewart was in the 1980s. The novel has been out of print for many years. The new printing will mark the beginning of something called the Sean Wong Book. It's a series, a collaboration, and partnership I'm spearheading with the University of Washington Press that is committed to preserving and promoting Asian American literature. The upcoming edition of Eda Bolletti will feature a new introduction by novelist Fei Eng. For me, it represents 50 years of both educating an audience to Asian American literature and promoting the work of forgotten Asian American writing that I began to read and rediscover in the late 60s and early 70s. When I was a young writer, I recognized the importance of promoting the work of writers who wrote and published a generation before me, and whose works lived in obscurity or were forgotten, such as that of Toshio Mori, John Okada, Hisai Yamamoto, even the anonymous Chinese immigrant writers who carved poems into the walls of the Angel Island Immigration Detention Station between 1910 and 1940. The lives of these writers and the publishing history of their work were unknown in the early 70s. That rediscovery led Jeffrey Chan, Frank Chin, Lawson Inada, and me to co-edit AI, an anthology of Asian American writers, which was published by Howard University Press in 1974. This fall, to commemorate the 45th anniversary of the anthology, the University of Washington Press has released a new third edition of IE, featuring a new forward by University of Oregon professor Tara Fickle, alongside introductions from previous editions of the anthology published by Doubleday, Plume, and Mentor. 
over the years. Professor Fickle will also be designing a website featuring a treasure trove of archival materials compiled during the compilation of the anthology, including letters between the four co-editors, correspondence with the authors, with editors at Howard University Press, interviews, drafts of the introductions, rejection letters, and editorial comments from publishers who turned down, i.e. prior to the acceptance by Howard University Press and related material from the files of the combined Asian American Resources Project, or CARP, an organization founded by the four co-editors of IE. In addition to these literary archives, we will be releasing documents and photos of the very first Asian American Writers Conference organized by CARP and held at the Oakland Museum in 1975. All of that history brings me to Okada's John Okada's Nono Boy, which the editors of IE stumbled upon in a used bookstore in San Francisco in 1970 and bought for 50 cents. The edition had been published in 1957 by Charles Tuttle Company and was one of only 1,500 copies printed. Okada's novel told the story of a young man in Shiro who returns to Seattle after World War II and after his incarceration in an internment camp and in prison for answering no-no to the loyalty oath on the leave clearance <coughs> application instituted in the camps by the War Relocation Authority. His refusal to volunteer for the draft and to pledge his loyalty to a country that violated his constitutional rights as an American citizen led him to prison. When he returns to Seattle, he is ostracized by nearly everyone both within the Japanese-American community and outside the Japanese-American community. The novel struck a chord in my search for Asian-American writing. It told the truth about a hidden part of Asian-American Asian history, and it was relevant to what was going on in the world around me as a young undergraduate at Berkeley, namely the civil rights movement and the anti-war protest against the Vietnam War. At the time, there were no Asian American literature classes offered. No professor even mentioned the name of an Asian American writer, nor did they have knowledge of any American writer of Asian ancestry. We were not hard to find. It's not as if we were hiding. When it came to No No Boy, my co-editors and I wanted the book to have a larger audience. By 1970, that first edition of No No Boy was still in print which meant very few people had read the book. Following the publication of IE, we went to work trying to get publishers to reprint many of the classics of Asian American literature, and we were met with rejection. In 1975, we began a campaign to get No No Boy reissued after it had finally got out of print. When no publisher took an interest, the four of us as CARP pulled together enough money to publish it ourselves in 1976 in an edition of 3,000 copies. That was all we could afford at the time. In fact, we did not have enough money to pay the printer, so we offered a discount to the readers if they purchased the book in advance of the release date. Before the book even came off the press, the entire first printing was sold out, mostly to Japanese American readers. The book's time had finally arrived, and the readers who ignored it, Okada now embraced him. We had made enough money to go into a second print, and in the middle of that printing from CARP, the UW Press inquired if they could obtain the rights to publish No No Boy. I remember being very irritated by the UW Press after I initially offered them the book to them, and they turned me down. And I remember telling them at a meeting that I had to mail each and every copy of the novel myself, carry them around in the trunk of my car, scrape together money for the publication. I challenged the UW Press to start printing other classics of Asian American literature. Essentially, the authors, all the authors included in IE, our anthology. And guess what? They did. One after another. Finally, in 1979, CARP turned over the rights to No No Boy to the UW Press because of their demonstrated commitment 
two page in American literature. In the 40 years they've been publishing Nona Void, they've sold over 158,000 copies of the book. Remember, it was originally published in an edition of 1,500 copies. Earlier this year, when Penguin announced they were publishing No No Boy, I was both confused and angered. Penguin had determined that the book was in the public domain, but I perceived their move as a violation of the copyright we had taken out in 1976 on behalf of the Okada family. Penguin didn't grasp how the history of the novel's publication was as important as the novel itself. It seemed to me that the literary estate of a writer of color was not of any value. Penguin had not even attempted to contact the Okada family, pay them royalties, or contact the current publisher, the UW Press. Before publishing and releasing their own version, the short version of the controversy is that the UW Press, Asian American writers, Asian American literary organizations, academic and scholarly organizations, all supported my call on social media to insist that Penguin acknowledge the violation and withdraw their edition from distribution. After just two and a half weeks of pressure on social media and negotiation among attorneys through the summer months this year, it was determined that the book was not in fact in the public domain and Penguin withdrew the book from distribution in the U.S. Dorothy. Dorothea Okada, John Okada's daughter, summed it up by stating that the family was happy with the 40-year history of their relationship with the UW Press, and there was no need for another publisher. In this case, a publisher who made no attempt to even contact them. What I learned very early on, even as an undergraduate student, is the value of the literary property of the writers who came before me. As a 20-year-old, I had reached out to the Okada family, flew down at my own expense to Los Angeles to meet John Okada's widow, Dorothy Okada, to say to her how much John's novel had meant to me and that I would make sure that it was recognized and brought back into print and would be read. Don't get me wrong, I support the publication of Asian American writers by all publishers, Penguin included. My novel, Home Base, and even IE, and the big IE were once printed, published by Penguin, or a subsidiary of Penguin. But the approach and process involved in their decision to publish No No Boy was clearly uninformed and poorly researched. In fact, several editors from other publishing companies have emailed me about the controversy and the teachable moment drawn out in the press, namely that books are not just property. Even if a book is determined to be in the public domain, I would expect an editor would reach out to the family of the author, both as a courtesy and to acknowledge their commitment to bring that author's book back into print. What Penguin didn't realize is that No No Boy occupies a place in my own literary history as it does for countless other Asian American writers today. Our knowledge of our own literary history has to be respected. Writer Viet Tan Nguyen tweeted in the midst of the Penguin controversy just this last June that he was, quote, disappointed in Penguin classics for appropriating John Okada's notable. And it was sobering to be reminded of how I am older than John Okada when he died, thinking his novel No No Boy has been ignored by American and Japanese Americans. If he had lived just 15 years more, he'd see his work read in universities and discussed deeply by scholars." Unquote. Nguyen's message was clear, that this particular book was a work that lived in our own personal literary histories, and that if a publisher wanted to publish classics works of Asian American literature, they should try asking one of us what the book means to us before assuming that it belonged to the public. UW Press began their Asian American literature publishing commitment by asking Asian American authors. And they now have the largest, most significant catalog of Asian American literature. Thank you.
wonderful. Uh, couldn't have predicted this, and it's, uh, it says something about the mighty San Jose State, because uh, the different schools I graduated from, Sean graduated from, and everything, no one has invited us to celebrate some of our work, but it takes San Jose State to do it. So, let's hear it. Thank you. I'm going to go that with my dad. Now, my dad passed away a long time ago, but back in the early 30s, he was farming these strawberries out there by Gilroy and other large towns known as like uh, Coyote and uh, Morgan Hill. And uh, he wanted to go to college. And so he came here to, I guess it was called San Jose's Normal Schools or something like that. And he felt pretty normal, so he showed up here. <laughs> and he went to school, and uh, an advisor told him, uh, you know, you're doing so well here, like in these science courses, you, you should consider uh, becoming a dentist. And so it was arranged for my dad to go up to, to uh, uh, the Cal School of Dentistry. And that's where he graduated. He didn't have, didn't have any money. And he said that he wanted to actually become a, a, a doctor. But he said he couldn't stand to see his parents sacrificing so much in the strawberry fields trying to support him. So he said, I couldn't quite stay those extra years. So I, that's how I became a dentist. But you know, he took the San Jose experience and became a very positive person. So after he got married and moved to Fresno, and he had this son, he named his son Lawson. And the reason he named him Lawson was my dad had learned how to play golf. Not just chop stuff with a hoe, but play golf. And so his favorite golfer at the time was a golfer named Lawson Little. So there I was, you know, named for a golfer. Shows a very positive, very positive person. But it began pretty much here. It began pretty much here. And this wonderful thing was, uh, you know, he said when he went up, when he went to school here, it was uh, it was pro probably all Caucasian. He would sit in these classes like a sore thumb, I guess, and, you know, because that, that's the way it was. People, you know, we were still, we were still you know, making our way into society. And he said when he got to the uh, medical school in, in San Francisco, they had a quota. Because some friend would whisper and tell him, you know, you're lucky here, you've got a quota on Orientals. And they had a quota on uh, Jews. He said they didn't have to have a quota on like Mexicans and Negroes because they wouldn't they wouldn't even apply. You see, so he remained very positive, having gone through all of that, learning that uh, wow, okay, you just kind of hang in there and stay in there, and uh, you know. So if my dad was here, he'd be very impressed by the turnout here. Look at all these people, and, and the fact that there are so many young ones. I only see a couple in here that's maybe older than 35. I don't know what you're doing here, actually. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. And I've also realized over the years that, you know, uh, life happens. And like Sean and I went through a period of trying to, trying to make it happen. <coughs> it's got to happen. And students just do, you know, like uh, have sit-ins on campus and make some certain demands and issues and have marches on campus. They had them right here on, at, on San Jose State campus. And it all mattered. It all mattered. But I think things just gradually change anyway. Just change anyway. So <clears throat> I don't know if it's a specific thing that happened, but I'd say just generally, look, the demographics have changed. And I think that's wonderful. So I, too, carry that same feeling of uh, optimism. So what was Sean was talking about was all the different things we had to go through, and, and that was then, but now it's now. So my feeling is just to tell you, well, appreciate it, enjoy it, and then take it from here. You know, take it from here. For those of us who come from so-called minorities or so-called uh, uh, people of color, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there's a tendency to kind of stay to yourself. But you know, you look around and everybody, and, you know, people are people. You know, you can, become friends, associates, you could, you could link up. That's the great story about IE is that four of us who didn't know each other really got together and said, let's do it. Let's, let's do this thing. Let's see what we do. And we actually didn't make money, but we spent money. Like when we decided to republish No-No Boy, the novel, 
Sean called me up. He said, "Boy, I've taken some. I've got some. Uh, uh, <coughs> I've got some bids on printing. If we want to print of this book, we're each going to have to kick in six hundred bucks. You know, we didn't have six hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know what that's equivalent like to today. You know, we're all poor and everything. But okay, you got it. We'll find that money and we'll do it." And then it would take a lot of meetings and everything. We were living in different parts of uh, the West Coast. And, uh, no question of money. We were just doing it. And I, I think we were doing it for our elders. Because they were the ones that were behind us that you know, allowed us to go on to college and to have actual careers and things like that. You know? And so I was thinking recently how um, 45 years, 45 years ago, 45 years ago, and I was just saying that over and over to myself, 45 years, 45 years, I was thinking back to 1973, 45 years, isn't that something, here we are, you know what I mean, we're having fun and enjoying it, but when I was saying 45 years, 45 years, 45 years, 45 years, it began to sound like there's no place like home, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And you know what I'm talking about. It's the Wizard of Oz. There's no place for 45 years, 45 years. And then I felt very sad. I felt, oh, man. Woo. So I realized that my grandparents had come to this country, sent my, my parents to college. My dad came here. My, my mom went to college in Santa Barbara. And then they did things for my generation. And I think what happened to me was like, when we were publishing IE and I was on the road to a career in the literary world or in the land of academia, I was like on the yellow brick road going on and on and on and I realized I had left my home behind me, you know. And so that's what made me sad when I thought about it. I said, boy, you know, my grandparents didn't know what I did when I left home. My parents knew what I did, but they didn't understand what I was doing. You know, and I was going to Yellow Brick Road. Because I grew up in Fresno. But Fresno needs a Yellow Brick Road to get on, to get out of there. You know I mean? Like Solity Willis. <laughs> And so I was sent out to graduate school in Iowa. And then from there I got a job teaching in New Hampshire, you see. So I remember when I came home from a, a, in the summertime to visit my grandparents in Fresno, my grandpa said, to me, what, what, what you do uh, in New Hampshire? I said, oh, I'm grandpa, I'm, uh, I'm, I teach in college. He said, oh, well, what you do? I said, well, uh, <clears throat> I go to a classroom, and I say, class, uh, we're reading uh, chapter two, and now we talk about it. <laughs> he said, you get paid for that? <laughs> so by the time I was publishing my work and we came up with IE, I'm sure they didn't have a clue what that was. And I tried to explain to my parents who were educated, but, you know, and I realized, doggone it, if I had my way now, if I could get back at that time, 45 years ago, I think one of the main things I would do would be, I would get Sean and the other editors and some of the elders uh, who are in the book who are, are bilingual and say, let's go back home. You know, instead of going to this and that fancy meeting or instead of trying to do this and that with this publisher and the blah, 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 Let's go to the home community, because that's what got us here. And so I was realizing just recently that made me feel so bad. Like I could I could take in a writer like Toshio Mori, who's in the you know, he was bilingual. He was a nursery man up in San Leandro. I could take him into uh, my community in Fresno and have them invite all the elders and everything. And Toshio would speak to them in Japanese, and they go, like, oh, "Yeah, you know what I mean? You know what I mean?" We could do the same with the things translated to Chinese, into Tagalog, and then give it back to the old people. And we'll do it and say, oh, now we get it. 
you know, and they would see us as being in the old tradition of the old days, on the way back to storytelling. See, so that's one thing that uh, I, I uh, well, it's not too late. You see, so I would guess that looking out at this audience, you know, you young ones could take this into whatever community got you here, because you know. Each campus is kind of like a moat around the campus. So you have an event, people aren't going to show up for the community. You know, they feel like they don't belong. So you could take it to them. Take it to them. I mean, we got a lot of languages here besides English, you know. And I'd like to, you know, take it to that community and say, oh, this is this is book and the da 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 and this is what they made and uh, yeah, yeah. My my uh, Japanese language isn't all that great, but I could introduce, you know. I'm going to go to about a Toshi Amoy this way. I don't think that I need to get it. And they would smile and say that they would get it. They would get it. Because if you look at the stories in IE, and I would definitely say you've got to get that book, they're all pretty readable. And you could see them being translated and shared with the audience members, and they would basically go like, oh, yeah, then they would get it. That's what you did. You put all this together. The only one they wouldn't get would be Frank Chin's uh, play. <laughs> which is really wonderful. And I think they would really love it too, because he was talking about, I'm a Chinaman, and I don't have a Chinaman, this gentleman, chicken coop Chinaman, this and that. And the one whole thing is, they would see where he's coming from. Because they got the same attitude too, a survival attitude, survival mentality. You see what I mean? As the elders do, otherwise they would not become elders. And so I think we could, we could pull it off. So I'd like to see something like that happen. Uh, since you're here, to reach out back to them. So, 45 years then, thinking about that is that's that's one thing I've learned. And another thing, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but things have changed so much that for you young ones, you're really in a wonderful situation to be here, wonderful campus, it's got great feelings to it. Sure, there had to be some work done behind the scenes to have things like uh, an Asian American program, Asian American studies, et cetera. There used to be like one, one Asian uh, faculty member here. But okay, that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. And then you have to stay with that and somehow keep, keep engaged. Now, another thing about writing I want to say to all of you is that you know, writing is something you can do. It's pretty easy, right? Thanks to your education, you could write. So then you've got to ask yourself, well, what do I have to say? And another thing about writing, especially poetry now, Sean writes novels and essays, as you see, that takes work. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn Chin and I write poetry. You know, you can sit down in Starbucks and write about three or four poems in the morning. <laughs> in the morning, so. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's really, I'm sitting in Starbucks right now, and it's starting to rain outside, but I got my latte, and I am so happy. Thank you. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you can keep writing, okay? Because you're already writing, so don't stop. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> big brothers, otherwise I would just, <laughs> okay, thank you so much for coming and I want to thank Professor Rada Williams for, you know, working so hard to get, get us here. Let's give her a, a she and the posse really helped us and, and I want to thank my big brothers over here, okay. I guess I represent the feministas. And the young and the young writers. And I'm a poet, yes. I sit at Star in Starbucks. And also I cross dress and write some fiction. Ah! <laughs> but in any case, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I want um, oh, is Dr. Dam's class here? What what? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> are there are you guys here? Raise your hand. I guess they're not. Oh, well, okay. All right, okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, um, 
I, I'll begin with the self-introduction of sorts. It's called How I Got That Name, an Essay on Assimilation. Can you hear me? I'm short and loud, okay. <laughs> I am Marilyn Malin Chin. Oh, how I love the resoluteness of that first person singular, followed by that stalwart indicative of B, without that uncertain ing of becoming. Of course, the name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea, when my father, the paper son, the late 1950s, obsessed with a bombshell blonde, transliterated Mei Ling to Maryland. And nobody dare question his initial impulse, but we all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency. And there I was, a wayward pink baby, named after some tragic white woman, <coughs> swollen with gin and nembutal. My mother couldn't pronounce the R. She dug me number one female <coughs> offshoot for brevity. Henceforth, she will live and die in sublime ignorance, flanked by loving children, the kitchen deity, while my father dithers a Tom Cat in Hong Kong trash, a gambler, a petty thug, who bought a chain of chop suey joints in Piss River, Oregon, <laughs> with bootleg Gucci cash. Nobody dared question his integrity given his nice, devout daughters and his bright, industrious sons, as if filial piety were the standard by which all earthly men were measured. Oh, how trustworthy our daughters, how thrifty our sons, how we managed to fool the experts in education, statistics, and demography. We're not very creative, but not adverse to rope learning, rope learning, rope learning. Indeed, they can use us. But the model minority is a tease. We know you are watching now, and we refuse to give you any. Oh, bamboo shoots, bamboo shoots, the further west we go, we'll hit east. The deeper down we dig, we'll find China. History has turned its tummy on a black, polluted beach where life doesn't hinge on that red, red wheelbarrow. But whether or not our new lover in that final episode of Santa Barbara will lean over Santa Cano and call us a bitch. <coughs> oh Lord, where have we gone wrong? We have no inner resources. Then one redolent spring morning, the great patriarch Chin peered down from his kiosk in heaven and saw that his descendants were ugly. One had a squarish head and a nose without a bridge, another's profile long and knobbed as a gourd. The third, the sad, brutish one, may never, never marry. And I, his least favorite, not quite boiled, not quite cooked, a plump pomfret simmering in my juices. Too listless to fight for my people's destiny. To kill without resistance is not slaughter, says a proverb. So I wait for imminent death. The fact that this death is also metaphorical is testament to my lethargy. So here lies Marilyn Mailing Chin, married once, twice to so-and-so, a Lee and a Wong, daughter of the virtuous Yurku and Wong, and Gigi Chin, the infamous, sister of a dozen, cousin of a million, survived by everybody and forgotten by all. She was neither black nor white, neither cherished nor vanquished. Just another squat her own bamboo grove, minding her poetry, when one day heaven was unmerciful and a chasm opened where she stood, like the jaws of a mighty white whale or the maw of a metaphysical Godzilla. It swallowed her whole. She not flinch, nor writhe, nor fret about the afterlife, but stayed solid as wood, happily, a little gnawed, tattered, mesmerized by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away.
Yeah, they're collected in, in the, yeah, I guess it's not 45 years, but maybe 30 years. I mean, I don't want to divulge my age. I have, like, uh, I have good hair. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, let me Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll find what it, okay. Um, I just want to do different, uh, different forms of poems. You know, um, uh, that was a dramatic monologue. You know, I guess you guys, some, there are slam poets out there. It's not slam. I really wrote it as a dramatic monologue first in the, in, yeah, uh, in the tradition of Shakespeare and uh, Browning and so forth. Um, um, okay, and this is a blues poem. And I, um, I'm so in love with the blues and Bessie Smith. So I, you know, I wrote this poem uh, in the fashion of Bessie Smith. It's called Blues on Yellow. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. Her husband, the crow, killed under the railroad. The spokes has shot his wings. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. Die, die, yellow bird, die, die. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle, yellow will ooze into white. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle, yellow will ooze into white. Run, run, sweet little Puritan, yellow will ooze into white. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow feet to fight. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow feet to fight. If you cut my yellow fists, I'll teach my yellow feet to write. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Buddha's compassion is nigh. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother, our boat will sail tonight. Your babies will reach the promised land. The stars will be their guide. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. Oh, take me to the land of the unreborn, there's no life on earth without pain. stanzas really you know true to the blues poem form and now I'm gonna read some bad girl libidinous haiku just to freak those guys out right <laughs> yeah oh yeah they'll, they'll be freaked out <laughs> the haiku I would not write this kind of thing in Starbucks or I might I'm, yeah <laughs> or the, yeah um, so I can't um, the haiku has become an American form. Uh, if you think about it, uh, your high school teacher makes you, you know, they ask you to write haiku, haiku greeting cards and so forth. It's really, and you guys have haiku parties or something. Yeah, it's, it's really an international pop form. And 
and African American poets such as Etheridge Knight and Sonia Sanchez has really, you know, developed the haiku into a protest form. Um, so um, it's just I, I, so I decided to write these haiku, but um, but in a bad girl, libidinous, anti-Zen fashion. Okay, <laughs> like I can't call them haiku because haiku is attached to to Zen spiritualism because. Uh, I just call them 17 syllable things. <laughs> 25 haiku. A hundred red fire ants scouring, scouring the white peony. Fallen plum blossoms return to the branch. You sleep, then harden again. Cuttlefish in my palm stiffens with rigor mortis. Boy, toys can't love. Are you guys old enough to be to be hearing this? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Neighbors, barn, grass mat, crickets, blue boy, trowel handle, dress soaked in mud. Iron-headed mace, double-studded halberd, sliced into emptiness. Oh, fierce oh goose, tie me to two wild elephants, tear me in half. Oh, my swarthy herder, two hump batrian, drive me the long distance. Forceps, tongs, bushy, whip, flanks, scabbard, stirrup, goes, distaff, wither, owl. Black-eyed Susans, Queen Anne's lace, Bounty of cyclamen, moan pass, erupt. Gaze at the charred hills, the woe-begone kiosk. We are all God's hussies. I have not fondled the emperor's lapdog, whose name is Black Muzzle. Urge your horses into the mist's wheel galley, O oh, sweet Bedlamite. Her majesty is rounding up the jewel stairs to find the Pleasure Dome, ancient pond, the frog jumps in and in and in the deep slap of water. The frog jumps into the ancient pond. She says, no, I am not ready. Coyote cooked his dead wife's vagina and fed it to his new wife. I plucked out three white pubic hairs and they turned into Flying monkeys. You can laugh, you know. I mean, they're really raunchy. You should laugh. <laughs> Let's do it on the antimacassar. On the antimacassar. That's a nerdy one. I mean, I have all those English majors out there. Little Red drew her teeny pistol from her basket and said, Eat me. Chimera, Madam Popot grafting a date tree onto a date tree. His unworthy appendage, his mutinous henchman, grazed my pink cheeks. He on top now changes to bottom. Goddess welcomes her devotee. Fish, fish, fowl, fowl, mock me, Mistress Bean Curd. I am both duck and essence. Sing, sing, little yellow blight. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't touch him, bitch. We're engaged. And besides, he's wearing my nipple ring. <laughs> the last one is a found haiku. One of my students said something to this effect into her cell phone. So it's a found haiku. <laughs> Thanks to you guys, yeah, with your vivid imaginations. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll end with. Um, I'll end with black president. So, um, so yeah, we'll have the, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little about form. This is what I call sonnet. A sonnet niece is a. It's a um, sonnet, but I embedded within the sonnet. Um, uh, chi you know, chi Chinese <coughs> lyrics, and that is to say, uh, there are oppositional couplets within the sonnet. So, so that's why I call uh, this form sonnet niece. 
this is for our black president. Okay. Black president. If a black man could be president, could a white man be his slave? Could a sinner enter heaven by uttering his name? If the Terminator is my governor, everybody knows who the term of Terminator is. I read this in China, and they know, yeah, everybody knows who the Terminator is. Could a cowboy be my king? When shall the cavalry enter Deadwood and save my prince? An exo cannibal eats her enemies. An endo cannibal eats her friends. I'd rather starve myself silly than to make a man's blood on the altar, blood on the lamb, blood in the chalice, not symbolic, but fresh. Thank you. Chinese and European author Diana Chang. Um, 
why do you think there were more Japanese women uh, authors um, represented than, than the, say, um, Chinese American authors, uh, women authors? <laughs> student at Berkeley, um, I decided when I was 19 that I wanted to be a novelist. And at the same time that I thought of that, I remember thinking, I'm the only Asian American writer I know in the world. I didn't know Frank Chin, I didn't know anybody, and no teacher ever assigned a book by Asian American writer or even mentioned a name. And I remember going to my teachers at Berkeley and asking them for the names of Asian American writers. And one teacher said, there aren't any. And uh, I remember thinking, wait a minute, we've been here for 150 years. Somebody must have written them. University Press decided that you know the manuscript was too big and we would do fiction first and do poetry later. And uh, so we agreed. Uh, and, uh, and that's sort of how the numbers fell out. Uh, yeah, and there were, um, yeah, and Lawson's poems were not included, but yeah, but the, but the, 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 the fiction writers. <laughs> but the idea was, you know, we would have a poetry anthology, which never came to pass. Oh, I see. Yeah. The answer up here, so uh, <laughs> I could see the people I'm talking to. Uh, I'm glad Sean is mentioning those things because this harkens back to a time that I don't, I don't know if it had ever happened in American history. Bunch of us people got together, different people started working together. So it's no accident, I would think, that with the advent of IE, the different groups that we affiliated with and worked with were each having like a renaissance or a, a generation of firsts. So in the 70s, you know, we have uh, Ishmael Reed's uh, anthology was a, a first multicultural collection of stories, okay? Black, brown, red, yellow, that's who he included. So he was a big force. He came out <coughs> from New York, he came out to Berkeley, and he liked to climb it. He started making friends and had people over and stuff, and so it was a big deal, because up until then, all of our different groups had been functioning separately, see? So Ishmael was a force. And it was a wonderful thing uh, for me to be invited because all that time, uh, as I indicated earlier, I was, I was going out into this world on the yellow brick road and it was like a lonely world, you know what I mean? Because uh, you try being an Asian in New Hampshire. <coughs> and the thing about being from Fresno, which has a huge Latino influence is that, man, once you get over the mountains, California, they ain't no Mexican food out there. There was none. I remember going into New York City with my wife. I said, I can't live anymore. I need some Mexican food. I couldn't find any. I went, in a, I went to look at a telephone director. They had Spanish food. See, I, mean? I kid you not. So 
This was a very segregated world, and because we grew up in a segregated world, we segregated each other from each other. It was kind of, maybe it was the divide and conquer mentality. You know? So for me to be working with these Chinese guys was quite a thing. See, because Chinese and Japanese didn't necessarily get along. And they didn't get along with Filipino. You see what I mean? African American didn't get along with Latino. Latino didn't necessarily get along with Puerto Rican. And nobody got along with Native American and all that stuff. And so in the 70s, all of these books came out, these anthologies. You can check it. All were firsts. All were firsts for the first time, et cetera, et cetera. And so what was happening was that, and we were successful enough so that the publishers had to deal and they could see that, hey, we can make a little money here. So there was another breakthrough that we had was like from the West to the East Coast, because the East Coast was, to this day, is still a publishing center, New York yeah. City. You see what I mean? And so a lot of things were happening. I was going to mention that uh, one thing that happened, I don't know if anything caused it so much as that, uh, I sound like your grandfather talking. <laughs> you know, in the old days, of life used to be so segregated, and you won't believe this almost. Like, so where I was living and raised in Fresno, which was a typical American community, we had the railroad tracks right there. And so over here was Asian, Black, Chicano section, and Native American, okay, people of color. We had our own culture, we had our own foods, okay. Over there was generic America. In generic America, if they wanted to eat, like let's say you said, I think I want to eat some ramen. You had to come over here to our side of town. <laughs> yeah, we, we, there was no Japanese food over there, no Chinese food, no Mexican food, so life was really segregated and eventually the food started to integrate. And so it's, it's amazing to think right now how that could have happened, you know, but that I think has pretty much happened on its own. So it's been you know, a wonderful thing to see, and not that you got to uh, uh, research this, but I think at, at your very least, whatever your ancestry is, look into their background, <coughs> look into their history in America here, go back, and see what kind of culture they produced. What did they do, you see? And one thing about Japanese America is that when we had those writers is that we came here and we established our own newspapers, okay? We established our own uh, writing communities. People were having writing groups and everything like that. And so by the time Ayi came along, we had published writers who had published in, you know, in Japantown, in English and in Japanese. And so I would guess if you look at the other ethnicities at the time, everybody was doing their thing. I think an extremely crucial thing for us to realize is that uh, what what happened when Ishmael Reed came to the West and I was able to show up at the party and meet Sean and Jeff and Frank, I think that's when IE started because after that uh, we said, let's go get a pizza. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's, this is America, it's Chinese and Japanese people, let's go and get a pizza. <laughs> we got a pizza and start talking. We realize, oh man, we're we're clicking along. We have all kinds of things that we could do together, you know. But I wanted to acknowledge uh, uh, what Ishmael did, and it's no accident that we published IE. Then after up uh, after let's say the generic publishers said, oh, we don't want that IE stuff. Uh, we went to Howard University Press, okay, Black University. It's no accident that. We went there, and they gave us a boost. So they, these things have to be acknowledged. Now, since uh, 1974, I like to think we've all been developing and changing, et cetera. And I want to share one thing with you, since this is a uh, uh, pretty much a classroom. I want to give you an assignment. Back in the 80s, uh, when I was still teaching, the 80s and 90s, Remember, students would uh, come up to me afterwards and said, uh, you know, what I would recommend, uh, what I what I should read, or you know, or ask me, what are you reading, and this and that. And, uh, I think it was in the late '80s or '90s. I said, uh, I'm reading uh, Chogyal Trungpa. They said, who's that? I said, well, you can look him up, Chogyal Trungpa. 
Okay, I say that to you too. Chul Gyan Chul. If I had to re-edit an anthology right now, I would include Chul Gyan Chul. Okay? Because what I'm talking about in literature, you know, we say there's drama, poetry, fiction, or there's also, let's say, non-fiction or, or spiritual writing. Chul Gyan Chulpa was born in Tibet, he's my age, he escaped Tibet and came to America, and he eventually founded uh, uh, Nalopa University in Boulder. But he was a deep, deep thinker, a deep, deep teacher, and he influenced, his students included Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, and Jack Kerouac. And so at Nalopa University, there's the Jack Kerouac School of Poetics, you see. So I would say, try out Chogyam Trumpa. I would say he include, we include him in the realm of Asian American literature. Here's a little sample of his uh, writing. He, he gave wonderful books full of teachings and stuff. This is just a little poem. He wrote also wrote some poems. This is called Timely Rain. In the jungle of flaming ego, may there be cool iceberg of Borichita. On the racetrack of bureaucracy, May there be the walk of the elephant. May the sumptuous castle of arrogance be destroyed by Vajra confidence. In the garden of gentle sanity, may you be bombarded by coconuts of wakefulness. <laughs> I would also include, but he's not, he's, I don't say he's an Asian American, he's more like French American. He's a great writer, Deep Nathan. People ask me what I was reading then. I would say, oh, Chogyam Chukpa, Thich Nhat Hanh. You ask me today, what are you reading? Well, you know, these writers, you can read over and over, and you're still not getting it. So you got to go back and read it. You know, you could start with, oh, I don't know, Chukpa, spiritual materialism. A writer I most recently discovered, this is only about 15 years ago when this book came out, uh, is the writer Nyogen Senzaki. He was the first pioneering Zen monk to come to America. He lived in obscurity in L.A. He was teaching people for free when they would come by and everything like that. He was a wonderful uh, writer. He learned English and everything. But Yogin Senzaki was, I think, of all of us who were in the camps, uh, I mean the concentration camps, internment camps, whatever you call it, I think he was the most profound. And he wrote poetry while he was in the camps. So even though he has books of teachings that would be beneficial to you. I'd like to share a little poem of his. He wrote this in the Heart Mountain concentration camp, which is the camp that most people from San Jose went to, Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Heart Mountain. Morning haze gives an illusion of California. The east wind promises the coming of spring. Within the snow-covered plateau of internment, evacuees can go no place else. They can admire only the gorgeous sunrise beyond the barbed wire fence above the hills and mountains. You get Senzaki. So all I'm saying is that maybe it's just getting older. I've you know, I think I've tried to expand my uh, my knowledge of things so that I keep trying to reach further. And I I found that being in college is really a place of growth and development. And when you leave college, that's when it's really starting. You know, and thanks to the internet and the computer, you could keep learning, keep finding more things, all go international. So I think starting from being an Asian American, I think you could look at that and cover that. And take it from there, keep, keep learning. I think the most uh, profound person that had an influence on me when I was your age it's Billy Holiday. And I kid you not. I used to go, uh, when I was a student at Berkeley in my sophomore year, it was about 18, 19 years ago. I would, instead of studying, I would go over to, to San Francisco. They had a, a nightclub there called Blackhawk Club. And they would bring the jazz musicians in. It was a little bitty nightclub. It was just a small place. But I remember going there. and. What I loved about the music was that it was very American. You know, that's what was great about African American music. It was American. At home, I might sing a Japanese song. You know, 
You might sing a Chinese song, you may sing a Mexican song, but in the real regular world, you know, African America was American. And so I was very drawn to the music and the music tended to inspire because, you know, we didn't know any we didn't know any writers that were Asian American. We had no role models or anything. So I sure gained a lot from them. I remember talking to uh, people like John Coltrane. He's a very quiet guy. John, how are you doing? He's very ministerial. But Billy Holiday, when I talked to Billy Holiday, she kind of she didn't say much. She says, Well, sure, and uh, we'll do this and that and this and that. I had a book of hers, she signed. <coughs> But she had a, such a depth to her that she just opened me up and made me want to express my own feelings, you see. And so something will happen to you in your life where something's going to happen to you, and it'll open up and it'll make you want to go into this, try that. You know, right now when you're young, your folks have told you to do this and that, or advisors in college tell you to do this and that. You'll see, something's going to happen. Would you say it? Did you say that it's uh, easier to discover um, newer voices now than it was back then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here's what we had to do then. I mean, one of the easier way, of course, is uh, I mean, just look at this campus, right? There's more of us. Uh, I was telling folks at dinner, you know, I got into Berkeley as an EOP student <coughs> because Asians were underrepresented minority in Berkeley. There were only 6% of the student population. They gave me a scholarship please come to Berkeley, we have no Asians there. Right? <laughs> just think about that. Right? So just having this community makes it easier for us to be heard, obviously. But also, you know, when we discovered, uh, also mentioned Tosha Mori, we found his book in a used bookstore uh, for 50 cents in, some, in 1970. Uh, and the book was published in 1949. Somebody glued a uh, newspaper review of his book in inside the cover of the book. And it was all yellowed, and it said at the very bottom of this newspaper review, Toshio Mori lives in San Leandro, California. And this was 1970. Uh, I was a junior at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and which is another thing, you know that Asian American literature was not hiding, it wasn't invisible, it was right there. Even an undergraduate English major could find it. Right? And, and I remember talking to Frank and I said, you gotta find this guy, Joshua Morton. Um, and, uh, and I said, 
I'm going to go to the library because that's what English majors do. And I'm going to do some research. And Frank says, wait, 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 wait. He goes, uh, let's just look in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, well, you know, what do you mean, look in the phone book? I said, this, this review, this book was published in 1949. This newspaper is from 1949. That was when I was born. And he says, let's just look in the photo. And so we get out the Oakland photo. And there's Toshio Mori's name. <laughs> so, uh, Frank says, let's call him up. <laughs> and I go, you call him up. <laughs> he goes, okay. So he calls the number. The person at the other end goes, hello. And Frank says, is this Toshio Mori? Yes. Is this Toshio Mori who wrote Yokohama, California? Silence. He said, yes. <laughs> Frank goes into a spiel, like when we met Lawson. We're, we're a couple of Chinese Americans, you know, we write, and we read your book, and we thought it was fabulous. Um, captures. Japanese American life in the East Bay. Uh, can we come over? <laughs> <laughs> and Toshio Mori said, uh, Yes. <laughs> so Frank and Jeff Chan and I got our little reel to reel tape recorder and we went over there. sat down and wanted to hear the story of his book. Um, and it was important to us because, uh, and what was interesting, as he was sitting there, um, you know, 20 years after his book was published, and he told us no one had ever come to talk to him about was in the uh, nursery business. And he pointed to the shelf. He goes, I have three unpublished books here. Would you be interested in them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing to us that, uh, uh, you know, this was the first Japanese American fiction that no one had come to see. We'd like to know what your life as a writer is. So we went over there, and and uh, that's what we began to do. You know, we find a book and because Frank had broken the code. Look in the phone book. <laughs> Every writer we found, we called them on the phone and invited ourselves over. <laughs> now we just Google. You know, or like. Students email me. Right? I read your novel. I have to do some homework on it. <laughs> right? You're a high school student. Do that to me. And I answered some questions on email, and then she said, um, I'd like to Skype you. Right? And I go, Okay. Uh, and then she Skypes me and she goes, Can I record you? And I go, man, you're one of those tryhards. <laughs> she was in middle school. <laughs> so I said, is your mother there? She goes, yes. He says, does your mother know you're talking to me? She goes, yes. I said, put her on. <laughs> Man, I'm not talking to middle school. <laughs> <laughs> so the mother comes on, she just comes her, her face in there, you know, and she goes, It's okay, I'm right here. <laughs> anyway, yes, it's much easier. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> what, what is your name, young man, who has that question? Uh, Joshua. Pardon? Joshua, Joshua Cruz. Joshua Cruz? Yeah. Okay, you're from around here? Yeah. And you're a student? 
Yeah. yeah. You interested in writing, being creative? Uh, madness, has a, madness has a big range. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, what I recommend, and that is to all of you, you know, I think it's, you know, we work as a team, so I'd get, get together with some friends and say, you know, start a little writing group. Next week, see, bring it, bring it to the good unit or something. Let's see what you wrote. That's interesting. You know, we can relate to it. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't have to be whatever fancy schmancy. Let's see what you got to say. I think one thing both of you got to say here is, and this is like the elephant in the room, is the Vietnam War. I would guess most of you who are Asian are here post Vietnam War. And so you got something to say that's interesting, that, that is not part of my experience. World War II experience, and I don't have the experience of parents adjusting to this land, etc. Et I think uh, I think I'm correct in assuming that about you, because the Japanese Americans kind of fade away. You know what I mean? That's just the way it is. They used to be much much more prominent, but it's fading away now. So I think you know, in this area, especially uh, there are many more like people, uh, you know, China, Southeast. saying is you've got something to say and the way to do it would be to I think I'd be involved with that read magazine. The magazine just sitting there and since this is such a rich private school the magazine got money to publish, I'd go over there and say, hey how do I help you edit this stuff? And I'll get published in here with some ad, you know, write some stuff down see because nowadays people are used to you. You know, if your name is Joshua, what's your last name Joshua? Chris. Her name is Joshua Cruz. Hey, here's a writer named Joshua Cruz. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> now, in our day, if your name was Joshua Cruz, they'd say, well, who's that? What kind of name, what kind of name is that? What? Plus, he got some, like, like some Spanish words in here. <laughs> you know what I mean? People didn't know what to, what to make of you. I was looking at, our, you know, look at I.E. People didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> like, I.E. was like, People said, ooh. <laughs> ooh. My book came out in 71. Look at that. It was like, what? What is that? <laughs> what in the world are these people left to you? you know, but nowadays, so many traditions have been broken or made, rather, so that it's easy for anybody in here. And another thing, not that many women were being published either. You know what I mean? Yeah, very, very, very few. Male dominated from the editors on down, and so the breakthroughs have been made. So if you want to, if you want to try something, try it out. When I was at uh, in the MFA program in Iowa, uh, I looked Lawson's work up because he was one of the first. Were you the first to get the MFA at Iowa? Frank never finished, right? No. no. And so, so <laughs> in my generation, it was myself, Kiss Jen. And David Wong Louie, and that was it. And there were no black students, and no, um, yeah, in, in my in my uh, my year. And now it's you know there's so many MFA programs now. Like you walk into one, you know, <laughs> across the street from from the coffee shop. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm, and here there's an MFA program here, right? Yeah, yeah. And so man said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, yeah, led by, yeah, some, yeah, yeah. And so man said, Chang, you know, a Chinese American fiction writer. So, um, and they're Instagram poets, for God's sake. <laughs> and you guys, I know you're Instagramming and putting up your poems everywhere. Don't, yeah, and you're slamming it and doing all kinds of stuff. So don't, yeah, yeah. So don't, uh, yeah. It's, there's just, there are more, you know, so, so many opportunities now, and it's, it's a rich, there, it's a rich world, yeah, there, there are possibilities. You've been getting assignments from these teachers, you know. Too bad I'm not going to see you next week. If I see you next week, I'm going to say, okay, you heard what uh, Professor Wong said about Toshio Mori, Yokohama, California, San Leandro, just up the road. Have you read that yet? Go ahead and check it out in the library, read it, you, your life will be enriched. Or I'm just thinking about, uh, this is what I mean, where it doesn't all have to happen in the campus. Ernest J. Gaines died. 
yeah. Now, you know, you had to say, like, oh, okay, I'll, let me go play some Ernie Gaines. You know, he was our age. He was, our, he was like our contemporary. And so these things, these are things like, uh, and I know among Asians, let's say, you used to, oh, I'm not interested in the Japanese American experience. I'm not interested in the concentration camp. You should be, because it kind of paved the way for your history. You see what I mean? And as a, a lot of us Asians have the idea of camp in common, you know, people came over here after the Vietnam War, were in camp, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, there's, uh, I think there's, there's homework out here that you can check out. You got another question? <coughs> as you all became the Asian American writers that you wanted to find, what kind of legacy did you hope to impart onto the next generations? Well, I think for me, I wanted the next generation of writer to know their literary history. Um, um, in the back of Ocean Vong's book, he uh, thanks the generation of Asian American writers who came before. You know, and that, uh, that was very meaningful to read that. That he was a student of his own literary history. Right? That he had read uh, the older generation of Asian American writers. And when you read the work of, of younger writers, you can tell who they read. You can really tell who they read. It's like a, a jazz musician. When they play, you know, you, other musicians say, oh, that person is classically trained. Or they can hear the influences of somebody else. When we read Asian American writers today, we can see in their work who they read, right? And who so, they're stealing from. And who they're stealing from. <laughs> so like uh, uh, Viet Nguyen, you know, Viet Nguyen uh, used the word ai, you know, in his book, right? And somebody asked him, said, uh, is that a reference to the anthology? He goes, oh yeah. Is because that was part of my education and I wanted to acknowledge it. Right? And so uh, when you read a Fei Ying's novel, uh, Bone, and she names the grammar school the Edith Eaton School, you know that she read the work of Sui Sen Fang, uh, whose, whose real name was Edith Eaton. And so writers plant these clues in their books as a way of saying, Know, here's who we read, and uh, and for me as a writer, uh, it's gratifying to see younger generation of writers who have a knowledge of that history and are uh, the kind of writers who uh, want to protect that history and also make it known. You know, just like how important No No Boy was to me. And to get Toshio Mori's unpublished books published, things like that. Also, in terms of the um, um, the drama, it's really hard to find drama in written form. And so I, you know, I, I you know, I look to, you know, the, it's very important that the IE includes dramatic, you know, uh, dra drama, you know, uh, playwrights, you know, and. Um, uh, those those texts are really hard to find now. Wakako's work and, and so forth, very hard to find. You also have these organizations, the Asian American Literary Organization, like Kuniman. Yeah, Kuniman. And uh, <coughs> Asian American Writers Workshop. I was invited uh, earlier this year to teach at Kuniman. Yeah. And my first words when I arrived at Kuniman, what took you so long <laughs> to call me? Right? Oh. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, they, uh, and it's, uh, and I think organizations like that uh, bring together all these generations of you know, writers together. Uh, uh, when I was at Berkeley, uh, there were 1,100 English majors, undergraduate English majors at Berkeley. I was the only Asian. I was the only Asian. I would raise my hand in a lecture room of 200 students, and the professor would say, yes, Sean. 
to see Gumby. <laughs> 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 and then I would look around and I'd go, oh, I get it. <laughs> Earlier you mentioned that Asian Americans have been here for 150 years, um, and I was wondering how come were you part of the first to make something like this anthology? How come there wasn't anybody that tried? What were their barriers uh, they had to face? Uh, you mean the older generation of writers? Yeah. yeah. Um, goes to what I was just saying, and that many of the older generation of writers have been working in complete isolation. They didn't know of any other Asian writer. Um, like John O'Connor, or they may have known writers in, in the camps. Uh, there were literary magazines in the camps, and that gave them a chance to sort of find each other. Um, the Japanese Americans were a little bit more organized, you know, in terms of their newspaper in the holiday editions of their community newspapers. But I think that it, the main thing was uh, was, uh, was that sense of isolation, you know, that, that is, uh, here's a work. They, uh, they didn't know each other. They didn't, they didn't do the thing that Lawson was recommending, you know, let's have a writing group, right? And, um, and so you had somebody like Louis Chu who wrote Eatable the Tea, he not only had to publish his book, but he had to invent a whole language, you know, a whole sort of street Chinese American English uh, in his work and do it uh, on his own. Um, uh, we accept that there is African American English, black English, uh, but people weren't ready to accept that there was Chinese American English that was spoken on the street. I think his book, Eat a Bowl of Tea, kind of hit a, a, a raw nerve. It's interesting that when I came out, you know, her book was reviewed everywhere. You know, the New Yorker, even the Rolling Stone, you know. And uh, we got two bad reviews out of all the reviews. And they were both from Asian Americans. <laughs> the only two Asian Americans to review our book gave us a bad review. <laughs> One was in Hawaii, the Hawaii Advertiser, in which the young man who wrote that review said, there's no such thing as Chinese American English, and there's no such thing as Japanese American English. He said, there's only one English, and it's written by Charles Dickens, and he, he gave us a list of those who actually wrote in English, right? And you can imagine who was on that list. Um, I think he even mentioned James Mitchell. Uh, <laughs> and then the other bad review was in an Asian American magazine called Bridge. Oh yeah, I remember Bridge. And the, and the, and the Bridge magazine writer made a list of all the writers that are the, of all the Asian communities that we had left out, even though he could not name any writers who were communities because this was the first anthology of Asian American literature. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a, it was an interesting time. You know, it's interesting for me to hear, uh, for us to hear the, and use the word Asian American all the time. Uh, I never used the word Asian American except on campus. <laughs> I don't go around saying, how are you doing? I'm an Asian American. <laughs> Let's go get some Asian American food. <laughs> I don't know who invented that term. I think Jeff, when he was, Jeff Chen, when he was teaching at San Francisco State, he called me up. It's in the late 60s or early 70s. I said, hey, Jeff, what can I do for you? He said, well, you know we're having a strike down here at San Francisco State. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I got news for you, man. I said, what? He said, you're an Asian American. I said, what? I don't want to be Asian American. You know? <laughs> I'm an Oriental. Listen, I was great. I was Oriental. You know, I'm sure the phone calls were made. You know, like you're no longer a Negro. You're an African American. <laughs> you're no longer a Mexican. You're Hispanic American. It's like I don't want to. I'm who I am. <laughs> I think a legacy was 
uh, you know, I always have to focus on Asian American, Asian American, Asian American. I think it's, it's nice to have your books come out and go into libraries and add to the cultural buffet in America. And it gives a perspective, it gives different flavors, uh, you know, different balance to things. Because one thing I know, and you know it too, even though you're a lot younger than I, I am, this, in this country, man, we're like programmed and indoctrinated, inundated in education by the, the powers that be, you see? So from your little, you get, you know, you got to read all of these textbooks that they're pumping out and pushing on you, you know what I mean? you got to see all this stuff on TV in Hollywood that they're putting on you. And we have very little input into that, so books are an inexpensive way of giving you some balance, giving you a perspective. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, now we got it, you know, because really, it's like these other forces out there are really powerful. People were being stereotyped. Ooh. It's kind of strange, you know. But that's a big human train. We just laughed when we were you know, so they had all these stereotypes. Uh, Asians, African Americans, uh, Native Americans, Latinos, and that stuff would sink into your system. So I'm glad to hear that there are some people that uh, you know uh, Los Tigres del Norte? Check them out. I would like to check. They're probably living over there across the street. Say, so, hey, man, what's happening? <laughs> what are you doing? I'm flashing on a book I read that was maybe the first Latino novel. What's it called? Choco or Pocho? Pocho, right? Pocho. Yeah, Pocho. Wasn't it in San Jose? Did it take place here in San Jose? They had an area in town called Salsi Puedes. Get out if you can. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this stuff is right under your feet, but as I said, it's coming at you, and you need that little bit of balance and things and flavors to get your perspective. Because we've all been injured in some kind. Thank you. This has been a wonderful evening. Um, so I know at dinner I had shared with Sean Wong that I encountered IE when, um, in my first Asian American Studies class back in 1978 at UC Davis. And it, it transformed my life. So I was a biochem major. And it was a pretty thick book for someone who was a science major. And I remember in that Asian American Studies class, a lot of us were science majors. So we hadn't really done the read. We were supposed to read, crack the book, and read it before the first class or second class, and we hadn't. So I remember George Kajiwada, who was the professor there, decided we're going to read in class. We're going to read from the book, because he figured out we hadn't done our reading. I'm sure none of you do that, right? So, so, But what I remember was, I think, like two paragraphs in, Students started sobbing. I'm gonna start crying right now. I started crying because it was the first time in my entire life I had heard an Asian American voice in literature. So it transformed my life. That book changed my life. It really changed the trajectory of my life, my educational life, my personal life. So I know when I shared this with you, Sean, that you had said that you get approached all the time um, by different generations of folks, and it harkens back to the question that was asked there. Would you mind sharing some of those those experiences or stories of the impact of this book um, on on students in the United States, um, you know, over the over the decades? Because it, it really it changed my educational life. Uh, I was I was just at an American Studies convention uh, in Honolulu, uh, and we had just uh, the book had just been released uh, a few weeks ago, and. Uh, <clears throat> it's a convention mostly of American studies professors, English professors. And they came by and picked up the book, and they uh, everybody had a story about the first time they encountered it, and which edition that they had on their shelf. Uh, some had the original edition, some had the later edition, but they uh, all talked about uh, not only uh, 
I think what was interesting was that it was where their knowledge, their first knowledge of Asian American literature came from. We, we know there are flaws in this book. We've been very well aware of them. But we also know that the people who point out the flaws in this book also got their first knowledge of Asian American Every scholarly work on the American literature, our book is rich at some point, and then people take exception to what we say, which is fine, which is great. Um, we uh, and and, it, and I think that's that's probably the most gratifying to us is that we started a conversation. We're not <coughs> controlling that conversation. We started. We were, as creative writers ourselves, we were in an unusual position. You know, unlike other writers, meaning white writers, um, <coughs> in order for it wasn't enough for us just to publish our own books. We had to educate an audience to Asian American literature before we had to publish it. So we felt that that was part of our responsibility in doing something like IE first. So we can't just publish our own little novel or book of poetry. We need to uh, educate an audience to this thing. And as I mentioned in my little essay, a lot of people, a lot of publishers uh, re rejected this manuscript when it was going through. <coughs> they said a lot of insulting things to us. Like, uh, I remember talking to this one editor, are the works in translation, he said. And I'm 20 years, 21 years old, I'm like, smart ass. So I said to him, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then another editor said, uh, you know, the least ethnic pieces are the best. And then another one says, you know, these stories read better as social history without all of this literary devices being used by the, the writers. It's only, it's worth was just as social history or case histories, and as social science. Uh, so we have to sort of work against all of that. You know. um, and this was a time when African American had Stories, African American literature anthologies had titles like Black Fire, Black Rage, you know, and they were all the stories and all the poems are about living in the ghetto, being in prison, uh, you know, getting arrested. There were no stories about middle class African American families. And, and uh, so um, there was a very limited view. Thing that we now know is multicultural. Thank, thank you so much, everybody. And it's just a real treat and honor to have you here with us tonight and to hear your experiences. And, um, thank you. So, I'm curious um, what kind of impact has your work in IE? had on readers from China or Japan or any of the Asian countries? Have you gotten feedback from people? Uh, I, I've been to, uh, I've been on several trips in China that are sponsored by the State Department and, and other organizations. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, at first, Scholars, uh, young scholars, graduate students were not interested in Chinese American literature at all. Uh, just not interested. And, um, and uh, in the last few years, they've become very interested in studying uh, uh, Chinese American uh, writers. Um, in Hong Kong, I was invited to a conference in, at Hong Kong University, in which Hong Kong University asked all the embassies in Hong Kong to send a writer of Chinese ancestry from their 
country who wrote in English. And so the American Embassy wanted to send Tanjin, the Pulitzer National Book Award winner. And um, uh, the people in Hong Kong University said, no, no, we don't want Tanjin. We want a real Chinese American who doesn't know Chinese. Because <laughs> <laughs> Han Jin's a, a immigrant, right? He's from China. And but they want like a real Chinese American. Yeah. You know, one who doesn't know Chinese and just writes in English. <laughs> so the embassy said, oh, well, that'd be Sean Long. He's ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and it was really, it was really interesting because there were uh, Chinese writers from the around the entire Pacific Rim, you know, Singapore, New Zealand, uh, and also from the UK. Uh, and I remember one day we were sitting in this sort of little beer garden, and this is what the conference organizers were waiting for. I was sitting there with Timothy Mo, who's uh, uh, British. And uh, uh, this other young woman named Xu Ming Tao, who's from New Zealand, right? And she was very young. She was in her 20s. She had just published her first book. And Timothy Mo and I are kind of the older writers. And we're sitting there drinking our beer. And we asked Xu Ming Tao, we said, so what's your novel about? And she looked at the two of us, and she just goes, oh, you know. Family and identity. <laughs> you know, we go, oh, yeah, okay, let's get another beer. <laughs> that was it. Right. She didn't even want to talk about it. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess we all write about the same thing, family and identity. Um, it was a funny moment. Then, but it was interesting, uh, and I think more of that's going on. It's, uh, it's not just Asian American literature anymore. It's just the diaspora. I, whenever I teach in Asian American literature, it's not Asian American. It's, it's, it's the writers uh, from the Pacific. Uh, people, uh, literature from Canada, literature from Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, we have common themes, and I want my students to, to see that those common themes you know, bring us all together. My students represent that diaspora and sort of demographics too as well. You know, maybe an important word there. <coughs> I was thinking of getting here with Asian American, Asian American, Asian American. <coughs> is America. I was reminded of when I went to my only trip abroad, I was invited to a conference in Berlin, Germany. They still had the wall up and everything, it was in 85. A lot of American troops around, okay, around the wall. And so I had a, a German guy who was close to mine. He said, okay, professor, we're going to go from this part. We're going to go across town and we're going to take the sun. And I said, okay. So the thing was, his name was George. So I walked up. Gave my subway ticket and stuff. I'm standing there. He said, professor, he said, no. when the train comes, don't hesitate. Get right in. I said, okay, okay. I said, what's the problem? He says, see those guys over there that are looking at you and leaning on that wall? The shave head guys, you know. I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot of tattoos and stuff. He said, those are our German skinheads, and they want to beat you up <laughs> <laughs> because of your American presence in Germany. I said, but, 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 but. But I'm, I'm, I'm an Asian American. He said, no, no, you're not. You're American. And they want to whip you behind. And I realized, I guess I'm an American. You know? I was thinking, how could I look like just a Japanese guy? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a learning experience. Because here we are, we're talking about all the blah, 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 blah. One time I was uh, teaching a class, and I had a blind student in there. And so... It was the beginning of the uh, semester, and uh, we were introducing ourselves. And uh, I said, Mr. Shields, so we're talking about where we're from and how we see ourselves and stuff. He says, well, as you can see, 
I can't see. He said, but one thing I am not is I am not a Caucasian. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, I've got to fill out these forms because I'm blind in school and stuff. And they always make me check Caucasian. He said, but you know, I ain't never been to Caucasia. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm Andrew Shields. And another thing I'm not is I'm not handicapped because I see somebody walking with a cap in hand begging. And I'm not that either. He always used to say, don't you see? I said, oh, OK. So then we were running around the room talking about that. OK, he's defining himself. And I remember. In, in, in the old days where identity was a big thing, we're always talking about our identity, you know. Are you Chinese or are you American? Are you this or that? So I said, well, what are you? You know, some of the, uh, let's say, Caucasian students said, well, you know, I'm Italian-American. And certain people, uh, like one guy said, I'm a Finnish-American. You can tell that that's the way they were raised. But the other people who were kind of like generic, they had to think of it. And then I realized that, well, hey, wait a minute, everybody's got an identity, like, like Mr. Shields here turned out he's actually Irish American. He got his own identity. And so it was pretty cool, because it shows you that you could be whatever you want. This is America. So one guy said, well, I'm, I'm a heavy metal American. <laughs> Other girl said, well, I'm a heavy American. You know what I mean? And this one guy said, well, I don't know about all that, but I'm a PK. And someone said, you're a PK? I am too. And I wonder, well, I said, what's a PK? Preacher's kid. <laughs> and so I realized that, uh, in a way, it's all good. It's all good. One of my Japanese-American friends where I live in Oregon, I saw her the other day. I said, Lynn, how's it going? She says, well, I've just finished my studies. I said, oh, I said, that's right. You've been studying Hebrew. She says, right, I'm Jewish. All right, now I'm going to say something about that. That's who she is, you know what I mean? She studied Hebrew and she became, she became Jewish. And so, you know, it's not, this is America. You have a choice of different kinds of, or you have multiple identities, right? Sometimes you're this, sometimes you're that. It's more retirees. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd like to ask some of you who are in here who are not Asian American, if we had time, you know, how do you see yourself? What are you? Let's hear that. And that's interesting, too. That could be very interesting. Instead of just taking people for granted. Because again, or even if you're all from the same Asian background, there's differences there. What are you? Sometimes it's a little different. Sometimes it's a little different. Sometimes it's all good. What are you? <laughs> um. Your dad's what? My dad's Algerian. Algerian? Yeah. Interesting. Um, my mom is Irish. So. Where'd they be at? They be at that school. My dad moved to Pennsylvania. College does that, right? Is that, is that <laughs> your dad's Algerian? Yeah, Algerian Wow. In a little Spanish? Yeah. Well, Small Algeria is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Algeria. Is that Camus? Yeah. 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 You read? You read? I haven't read him, but I know he's Algerian. It's oh. fun and Helene Sassou. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Camus has had a huge influence on uh, one of our major, I guess he was a pioneer in Asian American writers. I met him in Iowa when I was going to school there. Richard King was his name. And he was a Korean. He was from Korea, but he was a, yeah. he was in the army in the Korean War and he won a National Book Award for his knowledge. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. But he was very, very Korean, but he said,
just like a term like Chicano. I bet you they didn't. They didn't like it at all, man. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were rather like, I don't know what Spanish or something. Yeah, I still didn't know the derivation of the, the term Chicana, Chicano. If you were a true Chicana, have you ridden with a low rider? <laughs> Where was this at? <laughs> oh, you <laughs> Now, in literature, do you know the work of uh, Jose Montoya? Yes. Uh, there you go. There you go. Okay. It's all, it's all good. That's all I'm saying. Come on in Algeria. It's cool. <laughs> I'm realizing that people are getting stupid up for me this time. Why don't we... Um, well, I want to, um, well, one thing I want to do is, uh, they talked a lot about different books and different um, things that, that had an impact. And one, uh, off, one invitation I want to offer you is that if you're interested in Asian American literature, you can show up at my office, FO 102, sometime when I'm there, and you can look at my bookshelf. And I can at least show you, not everything, but I can certainly show you the impact of the University of Washington Press on the field, and um, quite a few of the, the pieces that they've anthologized and some of the anthologies that have been uh, done since then. So I can't teach Asian American literature this year, which is a great tragedy to me, but I can at least um, show you the books that you should be reading. <laughs> um, but I wanted to um, move to, I think this would be a good time um, for, the, for if you wanted to um, get your book signed, um, and also uh, for just us to 